So, where did we begin? Where did we start from? The very beginning? Hmm, interesting. Don't really know, could work backwards. That'd be an interesting one. So, where am I currently? Currently living with my mum and my brother, back in Manchester. Um, yeah. Um, on disability with severe complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, having daily panic, well, multiple panic attacks a day. And finding it hard to breathe and finding it hard to concentrate and do anything, really. Um, yeah, so how did I get like this? It's a good question. Um, I wasn't born like this. I wasn't born with any um, mental problems, mental health problems. Uh, and I've heard it was used a lot recently. Uh, a lot of people talking about mental health, uh, bringing it up, supporting it, saying they support it. So... What, what, what's, uh, and I, I thought I'd look at it a bit more closely. What is the cause? How did this happen? How do people get these mental health issues? Um, I think a lot, what a lot of people seem to be doing is concentrating on um, temporary fixes. Meditation. Um, don't get me wrong. Kind of works. Um, I hospitalized myself um, in 2019. And uh, because I was suicidal. Now, um, just before I get into that, what I've noticed a lot of people doing is concentrating on the symptoms it's themselves uh, of depression and anxiety and how to give alternate fixes to them. And the more I've spoken to people, hundreds, uh, actually possibly thousands of people now, um, what I've discovered is these issues all have a cause. So it seems very odd that people will concentrate on using tools to distract you from the cause and ignore it. Now, I did this uh, full full swing. Um, when I hospitalized myself, I was determined to get better. Uh, I followed all the advice, followed all the practices, and uh, I got out. I got out of hospital. And I had formed an insane routine. Uh, every minute of my day was planned. Completely organised. Um, not a moment went by without an activity. Um, learning multiple languages. Uh, learning to code. Uh, learning to program. Uh, compu learning different coding languages uh, for computer programming. And uh, exercising rigorously. Concentrating on my diet. Um, keeping a journal reading books, um, focusing on a million and one things. Uh, literally dove into everything. And um, every time I would have uh, my panic attacks, I um, start hyperventilating and uh, going dizzy and faint and finding it hard to breathe or see straight and losing the ability to control my muscles and um, basically becoming uh, feeling like I've been completely drained um, like in an instant it's, it's, it was a crazy uh, experience still getting them now um, what I discovered because um, I had a huge huge relapse and through learning psychology because part of the things of one of the things I was doing is studying psychology uh, very very in depth uh, across all spectrums. I wanted to understand myself. I wanted to understand what was going on and how things were... why things were going wrong in my head. Um, so, yeah, through all these studies and, and everything, uh, what really confused me is after following all the advice, doing everything I was told to do, taking all the medication I was told to take, uh, why things went south again. Uh, and what I realised is the the best analogy I think I've got I've got for it is uh, imagine you've got someone who has been stabbed um, big big stab wound a knife's gone straight inside them it's cut loads of things arteries all sorts cause chaos and then you and everyone and everyone around you tells you that the best thing for this stab wound is to leave the knife in. And concentrate on everything else. Uh, we'll give you, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep replacing the blood you're losing. 
and uh, give you painkillers and basically pretend everything's okay and which is the whole positive mental attitude thing you know pretend everything's okay and everything will be okay um that's a lie that's a that's a big fat lie um what i discovered is that people with these mental health issues like i haven't found any yet um who have like I've, i'm sorry well, i've i've met two people with mental health issues that um are from um physical trauma um that was you know uh, from from birth so you know a, a, a brain deformity which caused uh, a lifelong um, mental health issue everyone else i've spoken to their mental health comes from uh an event event or on multiple events and those events not being rectified uh, another word for it is injustice um, it's when people have, uh, like myself, what, what I did is I studied myself first uh, and then I came to a hypothesis and I wanted to test that hypothesis. So I looked at my life, like what's happened? Uh, I looked at how things have affected me. I thought, what is anxiety? Why am I having these panic attacks? And what am I thinking? But one of the, thing, one of the uh, things I did was called cognitive behavioral therapy among many of the therapies I've had. And with cognitive behavioural therapy, I studied my thoughts. Uh, so when I was having these panic attacks, I thought, okay, what, what am I thinking? And I discovered uh, I was uh, either reliving, well, sometimes I was, it, it appeared I thought I was back in a certain situation um, where I saw my son, uh, my child, um, heavily, heavily uh, abused. Um and there were also circumstances where I'd allowed myself to be abused. Now, one of the things I didn't know before going into hospital uh, were the definitions of different types of abuse. Um, that was uh, an interesting study. Um, so I researched, um, while uh, alongside uh, researching psychology, I researched the different types of abuse, physical, emotional, psychological, financial, and sexual. Now, I uh, grew up in an environment with a lot of aggression, a lot of shouting, a lot of manipulation, and some deviant behavior. So, uh, and I knew that some of it was wrong. Um, I didn't like any of it. Uh, I felt that a lot of it was, that all of it was wrong, really. Uh, and I was very unhappy. Um, with all of it. Uh, I was also brought up in Disney films, so, you know, I had a specific ideology of, of behaviours and how people should interact and treat each other. And my environment did not match that. Then I got married and I realised when I was going back over my marriage and my interactions with a lot of uh, my wife's friends were that these behaviors all fell into the category of abuse emotional psychological physical and sexual and financial and what confused me was the most uh, was when i report reported these behaviors to the police and nothing happened i was like okay and I reported these behaviours to the social services. And again, nothing happened. Um, so then I started talking to a lot of other people who presented with these same symptoms as I did. Uh, one of the advantages is when I came out of hospital, uh, I was moved in. I was homeless. So I was moved into a homeless shelter. And the second homeless shelter I was moved into uh, housed, I, th I, think, I think it was, it was between 100 and 100... Uh, Probably around 100 people, uh, maybe more. And almost all of them seem to have a drug addiction uh, or alcohol addiction, of, of you know, an addiction of one kind, one form or another. And when I talked to these people, um, their stories were quite, their life stories were quite horrific, um, for lack of a better word. These people had been through some horrific traumas, um, a lot of them involving things being done to them or, or their children or their grandchildren 
Uh, there were grandparents there. There were teenagers, you know, uh, all ages, all, all, all aspects of life, women, men, uh, children, all these people, homeless and in a homeless shelter full of drug, uh, full of uh, drugs and alcohol. Yeah, it was, it was quite scary. So, yeah, upon talking to these people, I began to come with an understanding. It's like, I, my coping mechanism is I'd become an addict to uh, distractions, uh, learning languages, learning coding, learning pro computer programming, learning psychology, uh, exercising, constantly keeping myself distracted. I wouldn't give my brain a chance to think and uh, about anything else other than what I instructed it to. Uh, even when going to bed, I'd put my headphones on, I would listen to uh, meditations. I was completely focused, um, which was one of the advantages uh, my medication helped with as well. Now, upon talking to all these people, I started to come to the bigger picture. All of these mental health issues arise from a certain level of injustice, like people having these things done to them or done to, pe the, done to their loved ones and nothing coming of it. Uh, no reprimands for the perpetrators. Um, and then I started to look into the facts and figures, uh, the studies done. Uh, like, how, how prevalent is this kind of situation? And it turns out it is kind of on an epidemic scale. The amount of people coming out um, and, and basically saying they've been abused and in abusive situations is insane. Uh, it's, it's, it's an absolutely huge number. The numbers across the board are huge. So I started to realize that my issue, um, because when I relapsed um, after, uh, in, when I think I was in my third homeless shelter, um, I'd been caring for my son uh, most of the time, again, uh, which was difficult uh, considering uh, what I was dealing with. Um, a lot of scary memories uh, that would come back. It would be like I was reliving them in the same place again. And uh, the medication also messed with my sleep. Uh, it was very difficult to get to sleep. And when I did get to sleep, the medication kept me asleep for a made it really hard to wake up. So uh, I was living with my son at one of these homeless shelters for uh, quite a number of months. Taking him to school, feeding him, helping him with his homework. Um, taking him to his, his martial arts classes, uh, swimming lessons, uh, doing the normal parent stuff um, while dealing with my other stuff. Um, we were running very little money at the time. I think we were surviving on about £250 a month uh, to feed my son and I uh, and for obviously and travel expenses and other stuff, which was a bit of a nightmare. Uh, it's kind of a Spartan lifestyle living off. Uh, you know, not a lot of very nutritious food. Um, it's very unhealthy living. Uh, he's having to go for to food banks uh, for food, uh, which is an interesting one because that's when I discovered I was only allowed three visits to a food bank a year. Three a year. So didn't have enough money to feed myself or my son. And we were only allowed three trips to a food bank. So once those three trips are done, you're not allowed to go again in the year. So even if you're starving. Which brought me to another interesting point. Uh, the number of children actually starving in the UK. Uh, virtually classed as a third world country now. And it's uh, a lot of it's hidden. It's out of sight. And there's also the interesting one of the difference between what doctors in the UK consider a healthy weight for a child... And what doctors in other Western countries consider a healthy weight for a child. Uh, you might want to look that one up. That's a, that's a, that was a fun fact finding time for me. So, um, anyway, uh, the whole COVID thing started, and some of the abusive behaviours I'd experienced before started happening to me again, uh, being done to me again by certain uh, people. And I had a relapse, uh, and then my. I wasn't allowed to see my son, not legally. Um, I wasn't, no, no people of authority told me I couldn't see my son, uh, but he was kept from me for uh, just over five months. Uh, and I struggled a great deal in that time, uh, coping with uh, my thoughts, uh, especially my memories of what happened to him. And when I did finally get to see him again, uh, he was not in good condition. 
he had uh, purple rings around his eyes. Um, he defecated. It, it, he'd, he'd soiled himself, and uh, there was urine in uh, his underwear and his trousers, and in a lot of the clothes in the back of the car. When I first got to see him again, he'd lost weight. I could see his ribs. Um, there were also a lot of um, bruises on him, um, about the size of fingers, in a pattern of like a grab. You know, bruise after bruise after bruise, like that big in a row. It's like when you grab someone really, really tight and each of your fingers, uh, the fingertips, leaves a bruise on the person. A lot of those, uh, also various other injuries, which concerned me greatly. So, what I did is, as I would assume any loving parent would do, or any normal person would do, is I took my son and I moved him. I took him away from the situation. Now, interestingly enough, when I took him to the doctors, because I was extremely concerned about all these injuries, which no one could give me any explanation for, um, uh, the doctor told me that these were normal bumps and bruises for a typical five-year-old child, which I thought was interesting because I'd, I raised my son um, from a baby. Uh, I was the one who spent all of the time with him. Um, took him everywhere, did all the things with him. Uh, there's a strange cat noise. Um, I got to know my son like very well, better than myself, in fact. Um, studied him very uh, closely throughout his entire life, so I could best know how to treat him and do things with him. Um, so yeah, uh, I knew that he had a clumsy phase uh, about the age of two when he was learning to walk and run and things. And then that went away quite quickly. Uh, and then um, I was told by the doctor that <laughs> he was a clumsy child, which I thought was interesting since uh, she'd spent a, t a maximum of 20 minutes with him. Uh, and I'd spent um, roughly four and a half years with him. If you take into account the times he'd been in school and nursery and away from me, um, a very small portion of his life he'd not been with me so that was odd um, so yeah well I think about, well, what I was getting at the whole mental health side of things what I've realised is that people go on about these about caring about it about wanting to do something about it uh, and yet all the services are provided um, are effectively distractions uh, they want you to talk about it. So I did. Uh, a lot. I didn't enjoy it. Uh, it uh, often made things worse. Um, it was basically an emotional roller, a constant emotional roller coaster. You're having to, not only am I re reliving the things when I don't want to, when something reminds me of it. If I see someone being aggressive with a child, um, shouting at them, grabbing them, dragging them along, um, I would have, you know, uh, I would go back, my memory would kick in and I would be reliving certain points that uh, of my life that I'd experienced, um, or sorry, seen my son experience. And the physical effects of that were something I'd never, I had experienced once before. Uh, I had a very severe uh, uh, injury from a blade. Uh, I lost a fair amount of blood and it was similar to that. Um, feeling completely faint, dizzy, seeing colors and stars. Um, finding it difficult to breathe and just basically stay awake, stay conscious. Uh, at the same time, your heart's absolutely pounding. You can feel your heartbeat all over your body. It was uh, terrifying every time. Um, it's very draining as well. Uh, I was a very fit person uh, at the start of all of this. And the toll on my body's been pretty, pretty excessive. Um, Uh, it's very difficult to deal with, especially when you're having multiple episodes of the, this type of day. So, uh, the whole point of this, yeah, um, what I've realised is people are trying to put pla uh, effectively put band-aids on stab wounds. Uh, it's not effective. It doesn't work. There is a suicide epidemic. There is an epidemic of abusive behaviours, uh, which is part and parcel. And everyone just wants to talk about it. We don't need to talk about it. We need action. Um, when people do things that are illegal, actually against the law, all these forms of abuse, 
uh, emotional, psychological, physical, uh, and financial, and sexual, they are illegal. Um, they are criminal offences. So the people, the perpetrators, that the people that are doing them, acting out these acts, uh, committing these acts, um, they are criminal, criminals, uh, and as such, they should be treated as such. Um, the way I've raised my son is whenever he did something, it was very difficult when he was two, when before he could he could talk properly. Obviously, uh, with a lot of children, teaching them right from wrong can be a struggle at first. Or getting them to behave the way you want them to behave uh, can be a struggle. So I took a Pavlovian uh, method, um, approach, sorry. And uh, I've read a lot of books on um, how to successfully raise a kid uh, emotionally and uh, just to, to, to do the best, like, to be the best I could. I wanted to be the best parent I could. So I read a lot, of, I did a lot of reading and combined that with a lot of experience I'd already had with my family's friend, uh, my, my family's the children in my family. And I went with a simple uh, reward system. Every time my son did something I wanted him to do, which was beneficial, um, I'd give him a treat, uh, which is usually uh, fruit. Uh, I taught him that fruits were basically like sweets and chocolate. So he'd get a piece of tangerine or a bit of apple or some grape or some mango, you know, something tasty and sweet. Uh, he's not overweight, by the way. How to have diabetes or anything like that? I didn't overdo it. Uh, so I would use this, and it worked uh, to get him dressed, to get him to do all sorts of things, and it worked. He was behaving the way I wanted him to behave. Um, by all accounts, everyone said he was a very well-behaved child. Um, everything I'd done had worked. Um, it was successful. So. Oh, I've lost my train of thought. So, yeah, sorry, with adults, uh, it seems to be the same way. I would also reprimand him uh, because obviously... Now, here's the bit where it gets interesting because I think technically it does classify as psychological or emotional, or emotional abuse. Um, what I would do is uh, when my son did something that upset me, like hurt another child or did something to mess the place up on purpose, you know, undo some work, or do something that caused damage, uh, monetary damage, or anything like that, um, or, or wasn't, you know, considered civilised. Uh, I would tell him that I was upset with him. Um, and why? I said, I, I don't, I, uh, I'd like you not to do that behaviour because it's not acceptable because of this. So I would explain... Uh, why I didn't think his behavior was acceptable and that got easier the more he understood the language uh, obviously it's very difficult to do to a two-year-old or a three-year-old uh, but it did get easier very quickly he did learn to speak and had a great understanding of he did, has a great understanding of the English language uh, quite well now so it worked and he would stop doing those behaviors quite quickly and uh, because obviously he has an emotional attachment to me and he wanted to make me happy um, as his parent, he liked it because obviously when I'm happy, he had a good time when, when he's, you know, think we both have a good time when we're happy. So, uh, kind of a, a form of manipulation. Um, but I thought it was for a good cause and it seemed to be acceptable in society to do that to a kid. Um, rather than completely baby led parenting and just let them do what they want, because in which case they're not going to learn what is considered right and wrong in society and the laws that we follow and prepare them for future on life, in my opinion. So, uh, I thought the same rule standards uh, went for adults as well. Uh, and what I've noticed is when people get away with criminal behaviour, they continue it. Um, uh, take drug dealers, for example. Uh, if they start selling drugs and they don't get caught, they're going to start selling more drugs, uh, collect more and sell more. Um, same goes for uh, serial killers. Um, they get away with it once, they might as well do it again. Uh, they've learned that that behaviour is not reprimanded. There is no consequence. So when you get away, when you do something that gives you pleasure and you don't have 
because let's face it, one, one thing I noticed about my son was he enjoyed destroying things from a young age, um, causing damage. And uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so we couldn't constantly replace everything he destroyed. Uh, instead, we taught him that, you know, this was upsetting because we'd worked hard to get the thing, those things for him. And it was also a lot of work to either repair them rep or replace them or clean them. Um, so that was the behavior we taught. Um, I taught. So, what happens when an adult gets away with abusive behaviour towards a child? They'll do it again, especially when it's rewarding. Um, so, this is what I've noticed. There's a lot of people getting away with abusive behaviours and it seems to be just continuing, continuing, continuing. And I didn't realise until I went to court a few times, uh, quite a few times, and had a lot of conversations with social services and the police that there's a lot of issues going on so if i was to do the investigation myself and try and provide evidence in the form of recordings judges don't like that at least the judges i've dealt with and uh, i was told that's not allowed okay so i'm not allowed to do the investigation myself i'm not allowed to provide the evidence myself Will the police and the social services do an investigation? Well, the social services will call the contact the police and ask them um, if there are any prior charges from the person. So if the person has got away with everything so far, and even if it's been reported to the police, police, it doesn't matter because unless the person has been charged, they're not classed as a criminal and they have no criminal history. So... How did they get caught then? This question started to stick in my mind. How do you catch someone who is actively abusing a child and the social services and the police won't do anything about it? The police aren't actively invested. I contacted the police uh, and told them what was happening. Um, I told them my son was in danger at the time uh, after he did a sneaky video call to let me know what was going on. Uh, a police officer then called me back and she said that she'd spoken to the mother. Uh, it was a phone call and everything was fine. I asked if you'd done a well check on, on, check on my child. Uh, they said they've spoken to the mother and everything was, uh, she said that everything, she's spoken to the mother and everything's fine. So she wasn't going to answer my question, completely stonewalling me and had no concerns for my son. Uh, I then got more messages from my son and um, he showed me some bruises on him and some more things that had happened, told me some more things that had happened. So my son was being actively abused and the police ignored it. Uh, social services ignored it. And when I brought it up in court, they told me that these were serious allegations and that was the end of it. So when it comes to my mental health, I'm still engaging with psychi psychiatrists and therapists because my reality, my reality uh, has been turned upside down. Uh, a lot of things have confused me. So the people around my son have been accused of all sorts. Um, <laughs> um, but that's the problem, accusations. Um, that's what they're called uh, without evidence. Uh, the police won't do an investigation and they won't accept... Uh, third-party evidence so how do they get caught what what changes um, what I've what I've come to the conclusion of is um, it's kind of I'm blaming Disney um, I, I, I was raised in a world where you do the right thing the moral and ethical things and everything turns out okay uh, as long as you just stick to it uh, hmm <laughs> Well, um, since then, I found out that my name has been used to by the group of people who abused my son um, to take out multiple bank accounts, loans, credit cards, and mail order accounts. They are paying those debts back very slowly, um, but apparently that's completely legal. Uh, I went on the fraud police website and checked on it, and that is, a, well, to report the crime, Apparently, it's not a crime unless someone um, causes monetary damage to a business. 
it doesn't matter. They can use your name, uh, they can steal your identity and do all sorts with it. And that's perfectly legal in the UK. It's only legal if they cause monetary damage to a business. So just to recap, um, my son was abused by a group of people. I was abused by a group of people. Um, it covered all five categories of abuse, physical, emotional, psychological, financial, and sexual. And since all this has started, uh, after five court cases, nothing has changed. Um, so yeah, I can understand why. Uh, and then one interesting thing is I went on to Facebook and I ended up joining a lot of groups because I wanted to know how to get some, if, if I could get somebody any help at all. And since then I've spoken to uh, hundreds and hundreds of other parents and uh, especially men. And this seems to be what happens all the time. And this is why uh, a lot of men are killing themselves, committing suicide. And they are in an abusive relationship. They try to make it work as a family unit. It breaks down. The uh, In a lot of the cases, the, uh, the wife, <laughs> in a lot of the cases, the wife will decide to um, go with someone else to have a different partner. Uh, to, and break the family up. And then all sorts happens. Now, a tricky one is, is because because of everything that happened, um, I became very untrusting. Uh, a lot of the people I was dealing with were extremely good at manipulating. They're extremely good at putting on like the fake, happy, you know, smiley, hey, how you doing? All, all the time. Uh, very friendly, seemed like very friendly people. Uh, but behind closed doors, they were doing some extremely criminal and abusive acts uh, to a child and to other adults. So this made me very cautious and very untrusting. And upon speaking to a lot of the parents, I did start to see some similarities with some of them. Um, so obviously the, the, the courts and the criminal system can't get it wrong every time, surely. Um, but yeah, I started to find a lot of similarities. A lot of guys um, basically bent over backwards when the child was born. You, a lot of mothers with postnatal depression, um, basically not wanting to look after the baby. Um, and then things just slowly getting worse for the, for the, for the other parent. Um, the parent who does all the work and looks after the kid and puts up with all the abuse. And then when they lose everything, literally everything, their home, their family, they can't see their kids anymore uh, because the other parent will stop them. Um, a lot of parents are using their kids for financial gain and just cutting the other parent out completely. Um, what I've noticed is it's possibly one of the worst forces, or it's the worst form of torture I can imagine. Um, it's like mourning for someone who's dead, but you know they're not dead. Instead, you know they're in some sort of prison. Um, so you've had a child. You formed a bond like no other in your life. Um, you would literally do anything for your kid. Um, anything. They come before everything and anyone in the world. And then you have that taken away from you. You have them taken away from you. And as I said in court, um, to be honest, I've been through a lot in my life and I could probably live with never seeing my son ever again if I knew he was safe. Uh, just to know he was safe. Um, that would be enough. But then to live in a life where you know your kid is not safe, where they're being actively abused uh, in the care of another parent or surrogate parents. And all the statistics show this. All the information is there. All the scientific information is there. It's all been done. It's all been correct. It's, it's all been looked at. Um, the children have a 600% uh, more likelihood, uh, higher likelihood of dying in the care of surrogate parents uh, or, when the, or when the family unit is broken. Um, the, uh, the, I can't remember the times of abuse, but 
yeah, the abuse, everything goes up tenfold or sixfold. So with all that information, why isn't anything being done about it? This is a, this is a question that really started to get to me and really started to confuse me. So what is actually happening? Why, why aren't the services doing anything? And there are some theories out there, which I've heard, but I've not fully investigated and I can't get all the figures on. But uh, a lot of people are talking about saying it's, it comes down to money. Uh, and in a lot of senses, that does make sense to me. Uh, but I'm not going to try and get inside these the, the minds of these people. Well, actually, I have since then. I've managed to get a diploma in forensic psychology. Um, and I am still actively learning. Well, I'm learning all the time. And um, psychology is becoming a big part of my life now, trying to understand why people behave the way they behave. Um, so, yeah, that's where I'm at now. I'm now 300 miles away from my son. Uh, I am limited uh, after a lot of fighting, um, <laughs> trying to get more time with him. I'm limited to seeing him, uh, I think it's now six times a year. Um, he was extremely upset when... He's, well, he's always upset because he wants to spend more time with me. Uh, and obviously he doesn't want to be abused. Um, but yeah. Uh, and slowly but surely, the amount of time we've been allowed to see each other, uh, he's allowed to spend time with me, has been, he's been cut down. Um, now I understand that it is different. It's a, it's a lot worse for a lot of other parents. Um, I had uh, numerous advantages. Um, my ability to stay calm and talk in court. And uh, I also spoke to a lot of people who gave me a lot of advice on the legalities and what I should do. So with those advantages, I think I've managed to keep a decent foothold in my son's life. Um, but yeah, as it stands at the moment, um, I spend every day fearful of what will happen to him. Uh, he is not safe. Uh, he is not being cared for properly. And he is, he's in danger. And I'm not allowed to do anything about it. So I have an option. Um, obviously, um, there are well, multiple options. Um, a lot of people I've spoken to uh, would say state that they would go my mainly fathers that they would go the illegal route and take matters into their own hands uh at which point what's the long game so you do that um the police find out you get arrested you go to prison and you don't see your kid for a very long time and in that time they either go back to the parent who's abusing them or they end up in foster care and the number of kids uh, in foster in the foster system who have uh, said they've been abused is incredibly high. So, uh, or do I try and go the legal route, which I've done, uh, and keep fighting until I can get him out of that situation? Now, one of the other issues is with the legal system, uh, it takes time, a lot of time. It's a very, very long process. And in the meantime... Um, when things are happening, when my son uh, gives me a secret phone call to tell me what's happening to him, uh, I then report that to social services. They tell me they won't do anything because it's an ongoing court case. So even if a kid is being abused, actively abused uh, while you're in court, um, the authorities won't do anything about it because it's an ongoing case. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, does it? <sighs> Welcome to the UK. So, here I am. Um, not entirely sure how to go about things. Constantly uh, having panic attacks and finding it almost impossible to sleep. Uh, my life is upside down. I'm trying to concentrate, uh, trying to focus on being productive. And every time I do, uh, it's like my body's and my mind is screaming at me, telling me that my son is in danger and I should be doing something about it right now. And that is how I live every day. Um, the stress is intense. It's very intense. 
and I'm doing everything I can to manage it and to stay sane, uh, as sane as I can be, and I don't really know where to go from here, um, other than keep taking things back to court. Uh, the other issue is um, do, I'm doing it, I'm representing myself, so I've also had to be studying law and how to do things that way uh, because I am very poor and I cannot afford legal representation. Um, um, yeah, I'm signed off for work. Uh, I can't even, I, I can't imagine a single job I could actually do right now because I can't focus and uh, I don't see the point in doing anything when it's not going to benefit my son. Mm. That's the other one as well. I've spoken to uh, countless parents who've spent uh, tens and tens of thousands of pounds on legal fees and got nowhere. Uh, some of them, their children have ended up dead uh, or in a uh, care system and reported some substantial abusive behaviours towards them. So no matter what happens, I, c I can't seem to see a way of keeping my son safe. Uh, and that is my reality now. So, yeah, uh, it seems like um, I'm not a religious person. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm scientific by nature. I've always followed scientific principles. And I appreciate that some scientists have claimed um, to be religious, um, but I've, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not. Uh, but so sorry, the point I was getting at is uh, if hell existed, I think I found it. Um, and I'd very much like to leave. And I think that is the point. That's why uh, so many people commit suicide. Um, when you can't see a way out of hell, uh, when you're living in hell, basically, uh, every day is a nightmare. Reality doesn't make sense. Um, or maybe it does, and we just can't accept it. Um, it, 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 it does turn your, your, your mind inside out. Like you're raised into a world where you're told uh, this is right and this is wrong and you believe it and everything around you says that there are good guys and bad guys good people bad people and if you do all the good stuff you get rewarded um, and you do you do you get the good feels um, you feel good about yourself and things generally you know feel better for everyone around you Just things go well um, and then you find out that there are a large number of people who take joy in hurting other people and they get away with it, uh, continuously, no matter what you do. Well, no, no matter what you do, but, uh, when you tell the authorities. So, yeah, I can appreciate uh, a lot of people uh, being in similar situations or the same situation uh, yeah but similar situations um, yeah so you, you are raised with one set of beliefs being told one set of values and that things work this way and then you grow up and find out that it was all a lie um, so yeah it does put you in a, a living hell uh, a daily nightmare and you go to sleep in it you wake up in it you eat in it but you force feed yourself to eat in it um, you try and survive um, uh, with some sort of hope that it will end uh, or you can take or you can make it then you can take back control because at the moment I, I have zero control over anything effectively um, I, I don't seem to have control over anything in my life um, it seems to have been a bit of an illusion. I don't think I have. I was ever was in control. Um, but yeah, you can take control and you could end it. Um, but then that also removes the possibility of things ever getting better. 
And it also means that there will be no one left to defend the child you're trying to defend. So, um, that's not an option. So it looks like I am literally going to continue. I'm going to continue walking through hell for my son. Um, in the hopes that I can improve his life at some point. Uh, I will do my best about that. So, uh, that's where we're at. Um, for anyone else going through this, um, I'm truly, truly sorry. Um, I don't have any answers for you, other than uh, the simple one that is, you do have the choice to kill yourself, but if you do, there won't be anyone to defend your child, uh, or to they will have one less person in their corner, if they've got anyone at all. So, it's up to you. Uh, I know what I'd rather do. Um, I will continue to walk through hell for my son. Um, I won't give up. And because, uh, you know what? Um, I, yeah, that's, that's why I can take it. There is a possibility, just like winning the lottery, that um, I can... Well, do something to keep him alive and keep him safe, keep him well, or at least improve his life in some way at some point. So, yeah, choices. What choices? <laughs>